Welcome, everyone. We will start our session in a few minutes. We are just waiting for a few more attendants to dial, to dial in. See you in a bit. All right. Hello and welcome to the Wacom Comic Week on this lovely Monday morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us. Thank you for dialing in on this first day of our online comics and creativity event brought to you by Wacom and Clip Studio Paint. We have a great session waiting for you. And today with the exceptional, tel exceptionally talented artist, uh, Azur Rocks, also known as Olga. Um, before we jump into the presentation, let me share some basic uh, housekeeping rules, um, which will make this session more enjoyable for all of us. And it's probably gonna warm up my voice a little bit. So here we go. The session is going to be lasting roughly one hour and we will have time for answering your questions um, towards the end. Um, please use the Q&A for the questions. So no chat, no hand rising because the chat tends to be a little bit messy when it comes to follow up on questions. So keep the chat for the fun and maybe for technical questions and the Q&A for questions actually um, directed to Olga. We do try our best to answer all the questions, uh, but sometimes they're just too many and we cannot answer them all. But do keep an eye on your inbox after the session because we'll we will be sharing a recap of this um, presentation in a few days time. Um, that is it. You might want to play around with the viewing options of Zoom in the top right corner to see the screen share and, uh, and the video stream from all that. Who are we? So some of you might know Wacom already. And for those who don't, we've been around for roughly 40 years. And we are a pioneer of digital pen input technology. So every time you're sitting in front of a computer and you realize that a mouse and a keyboard is possibly not cutting it, then you want to switch to a pen enabled device from us. And with us today is um, Clip Studio Paint. I'm not sure if Joanna is in the call she might be in a different session. So Clip Studio Paint is a versatile graphics software best suited for drawing and painting to create a wide range of content. With a wealth of unique features, it helps to create anything from illustrations over comics to concept art and animation. No matter if professional or hobbyist, Clip Studio Paint's natural drawing feel along with the comic features is loved by artists from around the world and you will see it in action today. Um, the last slide before we dive into the session is blatant advertising from our end. Um, do have a look at the special offers that we have for you ready on our e-store, um, ranging from a 5% off for um, the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro Pen Computer to up to 20% on our Wacom Intuos Pro Pen Tablet range of products. So if you're considering getting yourself some new gear um, and getting ready for the next lockdown, go check out our e-store and uh, shop around for offers. Without much further ado, let's hand over to Olga to start the session. Hello. Thanks for joining us, Olga. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. 
looking forward to this to this day with you today. So hit it. Me too. I'm so nervous, guys. So <laughs> yeah, no worries. there are so many people in this chat. I didn't expect that. So thank you for joining me. And I hope you will learn something today, or at least you will have fun, or both. That would be awesome. So um, I guess I will start off by telling you something about me. Let's do that. Uh, so basically, uh, I am an artist. I am currently a freelancer after uh, working for many years in the games industry and I decided to leave it and be my own boss, which I am now. And um, I live in Hamburg, Germany, but I was born in the Ukraine. So I saw somebody from Ukraine in the chat. So hello, I haven't been in the Ukraine for many, many years, but I still feel a homely love for it because I spent a lot of my childhood there. Um, yeah, and... Um, let me share my screen with you. Uh, where do I do it again? Here. So uh, this is me, uh, as you already probably he heard. And I want to start off by showing you some uh, of my art journey, where I started and how I got to where I am right now. So I think this is the oldest artwork I could find. Actually, a friend of mine found it in a really old notebook. Um, uh, and it, I think it's something from 1996 or something. So this kind of shows what I liked from right from the beginning when I started drawing. And it was drawing girls in cool outfits. I also liked to draw their pets and I always imagined them having all sorts of adventures. So mostly I was uh, drawing like princesses on adventures or princesses with very many dogs on adventures. So this was kind of my thing. And um, my parents back then realized uh, that I love to draw and I'm maybe not that bad at it. So they sent me to art school where I had to draw actually serious stuff like uh, still life and uh, shade and light and everything but actually I just wanted to draw princesses having adventures which was so every time uh, I tried to sneak in some princesses between here and there but I also drew some ser serious stuff and learned a lot there during this time so we go next to a little bit newer artworks but still very very old that was teenage me and um, there I, I still, as you can see, I drew a lot of girls. I'm still drawing mostly a lot of girls and women. It's just my favorite thing to draw. And uh, they were all really cool. And I liked sexy outfits right from my earliest age. So it was a lot of girls in sexy outfits. And I also always uh, came up with their stories. So I started drawing little comics. And by the way, the one crappy digitally colored image you see here on the top right. It was, I think, my first digital artwork done in some antique software. I don't even remember the name of. And it was done on a very early Wacom tablet. It was this big, like, like a postcard. And I think it was called Graphire. Did you have a Graphire? Yes, uh, we had. Yeah, so it was my first tablet. and. I think I used it for at least six, six or eight years. So it was very durable actually. Um, so yeah, this is my first digital artwork, what you see here. And during this time, I also discovered a manga and anime and I loved it. I was very into it. And I started drawing my own mangas uh, with a friend. So we wrote the stories together and I did most of the drawing and she assisted me like by scanning and doing a lot of uh, the editing of the images and so on. So, um, and well, one day we decided to just apply at a publishing house because at that time German, German produced mangas were becoming a thing and we decided if other people can do that, we can do that too. So we sent in stuff to the uh, to the publishing house and they actually agree, uh, liked it and they told us, okay, we will publish it. And uh, first it was a little short story that was published in a big manga anthology. And uh, then we drew 
actually four manga books, which I can show you here. So here's, here are also some pages from this time. I like when I look back at it, I was I was around 15, 16, 17 at the time. It was several years I was doing that. And I can't say from my perspective right now that the stories were very professionally well written. Probably not. Uh, more the opposite of that. Uh, but uh, we had a lot of fun and actually people enjoyed it. And I think it was funny to read, even when it was kind of wonky. And uh, the uh, what I learned from it is actually, uh, it was a great experience. So I learned a lot because as you can see, those, those things are really thick. So one of, uh, one book like this has like one, uh, 180 pages. So I had to draw about 800 pages of, uh, manga at this time. And I just learned a lot. So actually, if you are, if you are worried that you are not good at art yet, just draw a lot because you get so much better by just putting the time in so this was this time and that i uh was drawing so much for so long is probably what put me on the path of my professional career afterwards because i just practiced so much without even like noticing that i'm practicing i felt like i just i'm just doing what i want to do i want to tell stories and i was drawing all those pictures and by that I was becoming better every year during drawing that. So um, then this manga uh, part of my life ended kind of because the problem was that it was paid very badly. So I could do it while I was going to school and living with my parents, but I couldn't live off that uh, afterwards when I wanted to leave with my parents and leave, live my own life. And um, my parents also didn't really want me to like continue living at home forever. They wanted me to be a successful own person at some point. So they uh, suggested to me that I actually go to some sort of art school and learn something. And this, is, this was the time when I actually moved to Hamburg where I live now. So it was, I guess, about 15 years ago. And I haven't left since because I really love the city. And the time at the university, it was a design university, not actually like an illustration or comic or uh, like only art school, but also design. There was a lot of layouting and advertising and also we did some flash games and so on. So I learned a lot and I did a lot of experimentation in that time. And I also found out a lot what I don't want to be doing uh, through uh, university for example I realized that I probably will not become a photographer and probably will also not lay out magazines in the future because it was just not my thing and I think that's the great thing about education is that you have the chance to try out things and also realize what you don't like and don't want to do in the future after art school, I actually tried to freelance for the first time without any experience or idea how to do that. And I failed miserably. I was trying to do flash games with my ex-boyfriend of the time. And we just like, I think our games were funny, but we just had no idea how much work it is and how little you're paid in the end. So this was a test run and we failed and uh, with that, I decided to get a job, which I actually did not decide really. It was more a coincidence because uh, we, uh, at that time, my ex-boyfriend had a website about video games and we found out that one of the cool video game companies we know and we like the games of uh, called the Delic Entertainment is actually in Hamburg. So we uh, decided to make an interview with them for that website. And I came along and during that interview where we got to know the company and the people there, I mentioned, yeah, actually I'm also an artist. Uh, can, I, can I kind of work for you? And I showed them my work and I ended up working there for I think one or two years. And what I did there, you see now on the screen, it was a lot of 2D animation. So the games were point and click adventure games where a lot of characters on screen were animated and 
there were a lot, a lot of frames to draw, but it was such a great learning experience because again, I had to draw a lot of pictures. So it was just, I was getting better with every picture and just the process of drawing animation teaches you a lot about movement and anatomy and also expressions uh, like how people look when they do certain things, when they move, when they are sad, then they are angry and so on. And also I met a lot of people during working there who were also artists and we had kind of similar interests and we like games and we like doing art. And I also finally had people who I could learn from and get inspired by. Because before that in university, I didn't meet that many people who were actually drawing because a lot of people were doing design. But in, during this job, I finally found like my first real like art group where I could actually show my work and learn from them and give each other advice. And it was very valuable. So this is also from the time after I have been animating for several games, I got the chance to be the lead character designer for an, another game, which is called The Night of the Rabbit. And I designed almost all of the characters there working with the author of the game uh, back and forth. He told me what he imagined the characters to be like and I was designing them. So this was, I think my, my first favorite job where I really felt like the thing that I'm doing is really, fulfilling to me. I really enjoyed this process of bringing characters to life that didn't exist before. Um, but after this project ended, I had to leave because uh, all the contracts were project-based. And um, I went to other game companies because I thought, okay, I started making games now, so I will continue my career in games. And I was at another game company, which I hated because it was toxic. So I will not talk about that. <laughs> And then I ended uh, in another game company, which was less toxic and much nicer and where I actually enjoyed working and I worked for five years. And in, uh, it was in our games and they do free to play mobile games. And I worked on several projects there. And here is just an example of some of the work I did there. I did a lot during five years, as you can imagine. But uh, my favorite parts of the job were doing character designs again. Uh, what you can see on the left is um, how character designs usually start, uh, start for me. I do a lot of sketches, what a character could look like, and um, like in what direction the character could go in. And then we discuss it with the team and with game design and also with marketing because they also have opinions on everything. And after there are several rounds of making sketches uh, before a final design is decided on. And then as you see on the right, this is the final illustration of the character I did. So between the first sketches you see on the left and the final illustration, there were several iterations of more sketches in between to decide on the design before I do the illustration. And those illustrations I did, they took me a really long time. So. It, you don't finish an illustration like that, that in a day. It, it takes several days, or if there are a lot of characters in one illustration, it can take up several weeks even. So um, I think during this time, at some point, I kind of got tired of it. So I, I don't really enjoy working on an illustration for several weeks, which is what I realized. And also what I realized is that um, game jobs, especially mobile game jobs, didn't make me happy anymore that much because uh, I was missing what I loved more, most about doing art. And that was doing characters and especially drawing expressive characters and telling stories. And if you play mobile games, you probably know that there is not a lot of story there. Usually it's more about gameplay and that it's fun and it looks cute. And you don't get the chance to, uh, to like, tell a lot of like interesting expressions and poses. It's more like a lot of pretty pictures, but not that much emotional and storytelling pictures. And it took me a while to realize that. So I, I realized that I'm getting more and more unhappy in my game job. And I was wondering why. 
uh, and at, during this time I started going to art events and this is my favorite art event. Trojan Horse was a unicorn. This is not my artwork, it's by the amazing Helen Chen. And it's a yearly art event that is uh, ha first happened in Portugal and now in Malta and now it's postponed because of COVID, so sad. So it was, I think the most important experience of my life to go to events like this because there I got the chance to meet some of my biggest art heroes and people from really different um, um, industries where you can work as an artist because I was not aware of a lot of jobs that exist for artists. So I ended up in games because we had games companies here in Hamburg, but I never actually like thought where else I could work as an artist. And while going to art events and meeting people and uh, hearing them talk about their work and also showing them my work, uh, I realized that probably what I'm more interested in is actually not games, but animation because it's more storytelling related and it's more focused on characters and interaction and emotion. So and this is how over it was a process over several years where I decided, okay, I want to leave games and I want to work in animation and I needed to make the step at some point that I actually leave the company. But before that, I actually started practicing for what I wanted to do for animation. I was researching several jobs. I was talking to people, showing them my work and taking advice. And I also took some online classes and uh, I started doing some small jobs on the side. So I think in the most stressful time of this time period, I was doing my full-time job in the games company. And then I was coming home and also doing a second job, basically uh, practicing storyboards for animation. And I was very tired, but also uh, I wanted to do this because I needed kind of a stepping stone to change industries. And uh, now I'm a freelancer since a year. I um, left games a year ago and it has been great. Like I was very nervous at first and then also the whole pandemic happened right after I started freelancing. So I thought, okay, I'm doomed but I'm still alive, I'm earning money and I have really interesting jobs. And the great thing about freelancing is if I realize that some kind of job is not, I don't like it, I finish it and I never take this type of job again. So I kind of, I have more decisions. Like when you work in a company, when I worked in a games company before, I knew, okay, right now I'm working on this mobile game and when it's done, I will be working on the next mobile game. So it would kind of be, I don't have much freedom of choice there, but now I have. And I think this is my favorite part of freelancing. So now I will show you some of my more recent art. This is me witching on my Wacom tablet. Some more contemporary stuff. Uh, I also really love uh, working in traditional art. So I don't only draw digitally, I like to change things up a bit. So I work also a lot on paper and you see actually behind me is my um, traditional art drawing table where most of the um, ink and watercolor work happens and um, this is one of my viral hits online so I have to show it to you it doesn't appear. yes this one <laughs> I hope it's it's safe for work so it kind of blew up on Twitter. So I wanted to include it here. And I, I like to put in silly jokes in my work or also uh, draw comics and tell little stories. So this next one here, this was also quite popular on social media. I'm just often trying to just tell little stories that um, show what's important to me. I'm trying to like put something relatable or like some something something funny in there something from my own experience like for example I, I want people to feel less alone with their weird things and problems and also when they feel sad they realize okay there are people who are feeling the same or even when you have some really weird quirks about you where they think I must be the only one who is doing this weird thing but then you read a funny comic where somebody has like the same weird 
trait about themselves and you feel less alone. And this is, I think, my favorite part about like my private art and what I try to do in my in the art I do for myself and that I share online. Um, I also still really enjoy just drawing characters with different emotions and showing how they feel and how they go about their day and what they are uh, doing. So this is basically what I what I like doing most. And this is the character from my personal comic project that I'm working on on the side from like work work. And it's called Crimson Crush. And you will see more about it on social media. It's a, a lot to do and I don't have that much time to, uh, to actually only work on that. But I'm trying to take more, uh, as much time as possible for that. And you will see it soon, soon. Let me show you this final panel when, it's, when it loads. So I think it's a little bit laggy, but it's actually, it will have a lot of animation in it this, as well because I love animation. So yeah, that's basically a little bit of my art story. A very, very quick uh, run through, through that because I'm, I'm already really old, I'm 34. So I did a lot of art in my lifetime and I could show it to you for days if you would be interested. What you might find interesting maybe is what has inspired me through the years. So I put together a little bit of an inspiration board that you will see in a second, I guess. Open it. No? It has a little bit of a delay. So yeah, this is um, kind of a little bit of what has inspired me through the years. And it's also almost a little bit chronological. So on the left, you see more stuff that has been like my early inspirations on all the right, what inspires me now more, but it's still like, it's some of my favorite things and artists. So um, I think I started drawing as a kid because I had a children's book, books with great illustrations. Like some of them were so beautiful and I wanted to copy them and I wanted to draw like this. So they inspired me to actually draw a lot. I also copied a lot of Disney characters and so on. Probably everybody did that. And so my inspirations went from like a lot of children's book illustrations like you see on the left and also classic Art Nouveau work like Alphonse Mucha. And then I discovered like Disney movies and anime, like 90s Sailor Moon has been like a huge influence on me. And I picked this screenshot from it because it shows the silly facial expressions they had in there, which was my favorite thing about it. So this influenced me a lot. And I also liked a lot of manga. So you see here, Neon Genesis Evangelion has been a big influence on me. But I also liked Western comics. And uh, recently I am a lot into uh, artists who have more of a sketchy and more freestyle, which is like less tight and detail. So I follow a lot of different uh, Disney concept artists and story artists like you see in the right corner here. And I also like a lot of like for example, Studio Ghibli concept art because it's so light and airy and fluffy. So I would, I could talk a lot about all of those artists, but we have to continue slowly. So this is, uh, you can just see that it's great to get inspired by a lot of different things because you, I don't know if you can see all my inspirations in my art, probably not. And so, uh, for some artists, I just, like how they do the skin colors in their paintings or how they do line work and so on. So kind of my style evolved by trying to learn from different artists what I liked about their work the most. And of course, when you try to learn from somebody, you don't become a copy of them. You uh, just try to put this influence in your work. So it becomes a part of your style and because you have a lot of different influences, your style grows. So I heard a lot of people asking um, how to find your style, but I think you should not actively actually search for your style 
because it's something that evolves automatically because you're trying to learn from what you like and what inspires you. So uh, by looking at new inspirations and sometimes like changing up things a little bit and looking at new artists and not only getting inspired by the same ones over and over again, you actually like your, your style grows and evolves and you have some inspirations that are many, many years back and some inspirations are more recent and through that you develop your own style. So don't worry about like, what will my style be too much, but try to more incorporate things that you like into your style and it will get formed by itself. And also what I wanted to talk about because a lot of people are always curious what what software and brushes and tools uh, artists use. So I will show you some, some of the brushes I use. This is Photoshop, by the way, because this is the software I'm using the longest. I think I started using Photoshop when I was 14. And so I'm very used to it. And I also love Flip Studio Paint. So I use it a lot too, but I'm trying to get more used to it because I'm so used to Photoshop. And I'm trying to make more of a switch to Clip Studio Paint because it's more, um, it can actually do some really awesome things that Photoshop can't, but I'm very used to this program. So I will continue working on that for now. <laughs> and my favorite Photoshop brushes, are, let's see, can I draw here? So this is my favorite pencil brush. And it's by Kyle Webster and Kyle Webster brushes are free with Photoshop. So you have, if you have a Photoshop subscription, you just have to go uh, in the brush uh, panel to get more brushes over here. And you will end up on the Adobe website where you have a gazillion of more brushes to download. So you can experiment with all of them and try them out and find out which your favorites are, because I do believe that there are some magic brushes that make your art better. I, I'm not one of those artists who says, no, brush is unimportant and you shouldn't care about that. You should care about that. I think a good brush changes a lot, uh, but it's not the same for, all, uh, for everyone. So I love this pencil brush a lot because it has, it can be very wide when you tilt your pen a bit, but it can also be very precise when you hold it straight. So it gives me a lot of variation for sketching, but maybe somebody else who works in, uh, who works differently would not like the same type of brush. So I also really like ink brushes that have a lot of line variations. And this one is from the Xion Kim brush set. So actually my favorite brushes here, they have written, written on them what sets they come from when I know it from like this brush that I am using for many many years and I just don't know where I have it from but I have offered it as a download several times I don't know where it, where it comes from originally and the um, device I'm working on right now this is the Wacom Cintiq I think Pro 24 inch or something. And it's actually not mine. It's my boyfriend because due to Corona, he is working at home right now and he got his work home uh, shipped to, to our home from, uh, from work. And now I'm using it <laughs> because my Cintiq is really, really old. I had a work home Cintiq and it's the model that came out, I think the first Cintiq ever. And it came out like 15 years ago and it still works but it's kind of clunky and it doesn't have touch. So the newer Cintiqs are a little bit cooler in that regard. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit happy that we have this thing at home right now. And also what I love for working is my, my Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. This is the small, smaller one, the 13 inch, I guess. And um, I love it because I'm using it to work on the couch or in bed or everywhere, especially since I work from home all the time. I don't want to sit at my desk all the time. Sometimes I like to just lounge on the couch or something like that. And it's great to have a portable computer tablet to, to be able to work on that. I also use the iPad sometimes because it's lighter and 
when I was going out more and going to cafes to sketch people there and so on, I also brought my iPad along with me a lot because it has a longer battery time than the Mobile Studio Pro. But for actual work work where I have to use a lot of different softwares and where I need a little bit more like actually computing power and it's also bigger and it has express keys on the side. So I prefer the mobile studio for work and the iPad is more of a sketching thing that I use when I'm on the run. <laughs> so yeah, that's basically a bit about my setup. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them afterwards. And now let's get into actually the topic of this discussion after we have like almost, I have talked almost all the time off. So I want to talk to you about drawing expressive characters. And the first thing you need for expressive characters are of course expressive faces. And let me stop sharing this for a second. And start sharing this. So I have pre-recorded it a bit to to be uh, to show it a little bit quicker. This is not real time how I draw. So the important thing when you draw faces is to have like a way to simplify them. So I always start off with like a, an oval overall face shape with like a cross in the beginning to indicate where the middle of the face is and where the horizontal middle of the face is. So I know when the nose and the eyes are. And I also make a, like two circles for eyes and like a block for a nose to block it in. And then I start detailing out the other face. Like this, it's easier to, to draw a lot of different like faces to start off more easily and also try different face shapes. Like you can already start like with a variety of face shapes when you start roughly like this. So you can make more of a square face for like a manly man or more of a round face for a cute baby. So um, this is uh, how, I, how I think it is easier to actually simplify faces and to make them more um, uh, quick to draw. Because especially when you want to draw storyboards or comics is you need to draw a lot and you need to plan out things first before you start detailing them out. And for that, it's good to find some shorthands how to simplify faces. Let me show you another video. Mm -hmm. It's also handy to um, draw different face perspectives more easily. So when you start off with the general head shape broadly, and then the two crosses, to in, uh, the two lines in the cross to indicate the middle of the face, it's easier to draw faces from different perspectives. And, and as you can see, what I'm doing here is really rough. So it's not detailed, finished illustration faces yet, but it's already a good start. So when you when you have the, the broad shape and lines and draw some circles in on, for the eyes, you already have a base to start working on and then you can start sculpting your facial expression and the character, what the character looks like on top of that. So this is like my first really important recommendation is to, to develop like a shorthand style, how to, how to break down faces in the, um, more simple shape to draw them quickly. And then you can start detailing them out. Um, so I will share the other screen again. So here you can see um, the faces I have drawn in the video really quick. And I can remove the line art layer Why well, cannot? Everything is really slow right now. Hey, maybe my Photoshop crashed. Can you still hear me? Is everything fine? We can hear you, no problem. 
Oh, okay, it's back, it's back, it's alive. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I can remove the line out uh, layer and you see, this is how I start drawing when I draw characters. I always like draw this, this broad skull shape and indicate where the nose and the eyes will be because like that, I can already get perspective. And this is basically also like a little bit how I start drawing characters when when I plan out a comic or a storyboard frame because I want to show perspective and how they are located to each other. And then I start drawing the actual face and expression, expression on top of that. And for that, it's also important to think about the eyes a little bit. So human eyes are actually balls. They are not flat. So when you're trying to show them in different perspectives or they are looking into different uh, perspectives, um, they actually, the iris moves on a ball. So it is, it gets deformed and it hides a little bit between, um, behind the eyelids. So here's again, the, 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 the eyes without the eye lines, it's just a bunch of circles. And then you can start drawing the eyes on top of that and detailing them out and always think about this circular shape of the eyes. So before I go a little bit into a little bit of a demo how I draw facial expressions, I have a little poll for you and we will see how much we get done of this. So I, I, I was told that I can stay a little bit longer than an hour, right? So I will try to get a, like a really quick sketch in the end and you can choose the characters for that, what, what they will be like. So please do the poll now. <laughs> You can choose the character traits for the character one and some character traits for the character B. Uh, one and B, this is great. I have a system. <laughs> and then I will try to combine both of those traits into one uh, picture of two characters who will be actually interacting. So okay. please the, choose. The poll is now live. You can basically... Uh sort of multiple choice, dial in and share the emotion or mood that you want a character to be in. And yes, we do have a little bit extra time towards the end of the session, no worries. I think the next session is not starting until three, so. Um. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's just, people will drop out slowly because they're getting hungry and it's like lunchtime, but I will continue to <laughs> Maybe not until three, I will also get hungry at some point. So while, while you are do, doing the poll, I will continue drawing a little bit. So here I have drawn a base face. Um, which is like in a little bit of a basic uh, mood with a simple smile, not a lot of extreme emotion going on there. And I have also made like a copy of his face without the facial expressions. Okay, I can draw in facial expressions a little bit more quickly. Um, so one thing to practice uh, facial expressions and the best way to do it actually, what I found for me is to actually do those facial expressions yourself. So you have a face most probably, and <laughs> you can like you don't need to search for reference images on the internet for many hours to find the perfect expression for you you can actually try it out and figure out how it works so and also by doing so you will feel what kind of muscles in your face are engaged when you do some expression like if you look like really evil you feel oh my my brows feel really tense so probably this is an important part of this expression so for example if i want to draw an angry face now I realize, okay, the, draw, uh, the, the brows will be really tie, uh, pulled down onto the eyes and maybe some, uh, some folds between them, some creases, which you also see when you tr try the expression in front of the mirror. So my character will also probably like squint the eyes a little bit so the eyelids eye a little bit more. Uh, push together. Okay. 
We have some results if you want to hear them. Don't tell me yet. Okay. <laughs> and then you're, you're thinking what, what the mouth should be of this uh, character. And then... can do some very tense lips, or if you want, oh no, I don't want that. Can open the mouth and make the character talk. And uh, like this, you can you can intensify the expression when you feel like like it needs more. You realize, okay, she's not not really angry enough. Let's push the eyebrows down even more. Add more creases. Even more of the squint here. And you, you realize that she is already getting, getting even more angry. So let's. And the same goes for, for like lighter expressions when somebody is more happy doesn't have to be a angry, dense expression. So again, try out the face. Like imagine you are being really happy and you're like, ah, I'm smiling. And you realize, okay, my brows, they are raising up and I'm smiling. And probably at some point, if you smile too much, your cheeks start to hurt. So you feel, okay, this is, these are the part of, parts of the face that are very engaged at this time. So you try to draw it for your character. So the eyes are more wide open, but also because the cheeks are pushing up on them, the, the lower eyelids are kind of pushed up a bit from, from the cheek motion. And the eyebrows are raised. And the character is smiling. Maybe I give you her less of eye, eye bags, more cheek. And also, if you if you are opening the mouth of somebody, of course, their chin has to go down a little bit. And if somebody smiles, you can make the cheeks a little bit wider to accommodate for that. And many expressions are also a bit su su more subtle than that. So they are not that extreme as a wide smile or uh, a really even, angry pushed together face. So if you want to, to show more subtle emotions, you have to also draw more, more subtle movements in your face. So if you want to draw somebody who is maybe a little bit disappointed but like not extremely sad or crying you have like more of the neutral eyes like the first face here but you do a little bit of a curved eyebrow And already you have um, 
sad or disappointed facial expression, which is like, it's not that extreme as, as the previous expressions I have shown. So think a lot about subtle expression like uh, expressions like this. Like when I try to copy this face and I just change it a little bit. I, I will not change it that much, that strongly to a completely different expressions, but maybe now one eyebrow goes a little bit more down than the other one. And by, by going down, it also maybe pushes the lid down a little bit. And you see that by, by just like this little subtle change, you already have a different expression. It's more, she's like a little bit skeptical and like, what's going on here? What, what, what's happening? So it's a, like really tiny changes can make a huge difference. That's why it's good to um, first start sketching lightly so you can still do changes while you are drawing. So start sketching as roughly as possible as long as you understand what's going on there and don't be too precious about what you have drawn because if you if you uh, detail your face out too much and you realize huh but the expression is kind of not not showing what i really wanted to show it's not the emotion i'm trying to convey you need to to change things and you need to erase things that you and you might think this isn't the most beautiful eye i have ever drawn i don't want to erase that and that's why you should start roughly and you can make the really pretty drawing on top of that in the end when you are happy with what you have drawn and the emotion is uh, conveyed properly. Let's try another one. And I'm just changing up little things and maybe maybe having a bit of a squinted eye, uh, eyelid here. And she's getting more and more skeptical and a little bit pissed now. So try to, to experiment a lot, especially with, with the eyebrows, but also what the eyelids do to the eyes and how they change the eye shape. And um, also like really subtle changes to the lip curve do a lot of work for you when you uh, when you're trying facial expressions like you you know like maybe when you when you talk to a person and they're first looking neutral and then they are like kind of raising one eyebrow just a little bit you realize okay now they are kind of skeptical about what i said so those tiny reactions is what you want to have in your artwork if you want it to be expression ex expressive and especially when you're doing comic work or storyboard work for animation, you need those tiny changes in facial expressions to, um, to actually uh, convey changes in emotions. Because usually a person doesn't go from like neutral to like full angry immediately. Sometimes it happens and it can be very dramatic, but think about more subtle changes first, because for most, uh, life situations when people are talking to each other or like reacting to what they saw or heard their uh, their expressions are really subtle and you need to find ways to show it in your work are there like any questions regarding this i can draw some more facial expressions in the meantime and if you have any questions regarding facial expressions i could talk about right now while i draw some you can tell me there's a lot of questions that are coming in through the Q and A's. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, trying to stay on top of them. So, um, and you, you've touched it before. Um, the question of how to draw realistic eyes um, when you mentioned um, 
people should remember that it's actually a ball and it's a, it's a f- spheric shape and not just a circle. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot going into the direction like, okay, how do I make it look natural? So yeah, there's a lot of practice. Why, why is my Photoshop sometimes like just stuck? So I wanted to show the previous uh, slide again. When it is there, I will show it. But it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of trying out different stylizations as well. But to me, it really helps to start off with the basic skull and put it in real eyeballs, balls. And then I draw the eyelids on top of the eyeballs. Like I imagine this is a ball and there is skin over it. So you you have to, I ah, know it works. So you, yeah. you see that um, here, for example, the, the eyelid is a curve and not a straight line. Or for example, here also, the, it, it curves around the ball. And complicated are those facial expressions where the face is like looking up or down because then you, you don't see that both mm-hmm. eyes clearly and they start to get covered by, by the nose, like you see in the bottom expressions here. So that also helps to actually draw in both eyeballs so you know where they are kind of in the skull and then you see what part is covered up by the nose. And if you're uh, like, I usually don't draw like fully realistic. I think it's another level of complexity and I don't really enjoy drawing realistically. So I, my characters are a little bit more stylized and I think it's a little bit easier to convey emotions when you when you have a more stylized character because there is less going on in the face than with right. a fully realistic character. So this is why I prefer more stylized style. But once you you have like the base of the face and you have like your blocks for the eyes and the nose, you can also try to render them more realistically afterwards. You have to maybe change proportions a bit so the eyeballs will be a bit smaller in the face. Not, uh, not like in my, uh, like more of my style here where the eyes are pretty big. Um, and there you can also, with the same rules, you can also go into a more realistic directions, uh, direction when you draw on top of your base. Right. I hope it helps. <laughs> <laughs> Relate to that question is, um, how much is, how important is the understanding of, uh, uh, anatomy. Anatomy is really important, um, and I would uh, love to explain like how I break down anatomy. And I think I will show you a little bit of that when we do the two characters that you chose. Um, but I can don't have time to like do a full breakdown of human anatomy now. But what helped me a lot is a lot of life drawing, uh, like life drawing with. Uh, real models now due to COVID you shouldn't go to live drawing sessions but there are a lot online on YouTube and there are websites that show you photos of models and different poses and then you also you try to find ways to simplify the human body and not start detailing it out immediately and I will show it to you in a, in a bit when we are going to the character part all right Any more questions regarding faces? Otherwise, we can just continue going to the... No, I think that's it for the second. We've got like 68, 69 open questions in the (laughs) Q&A. You can just pick them out uh, in between. Yeah. I I will draw one last face. Ah, here's a question that might lead to the to to the next section. Um, okay. The expressions on face are very different from body gestures. I find it really hard to use both together. What's your way of doing it? It's a combination of gestures and of body gestures and face expressions. Um, so basically, I first actually start with a gesture, with a body gesture, when I know that you will see the character's uh, full body or more of their body. And then I start detailing out the face, but sometimes I switch it up. So let's just jump in into the next 
into the next part. We have seen enough cases already. Now, uh, maybe one last question that popped up. Okay. Um, how do you have, what does it say? Um, how to have same emotion, but different expression for different people? Mm, for that, it actually helps to, to look a little bit how other people do the same emotions. So I try to study movies, for example, a lot and look how uh, the actors are doing different emotions or just like ask your friends, like look angry at me and you will notice maybe some things about their face changes. But also uh, when, you, when your characters have distinct facial features, like different face shapes and slightly different eye shapes and also different eyebrows and lips and so on, when the, even when you try to draw like exactly the same emotion, it will not turn out exactly the same than on the previous character. Like when I draw this, this cute girl angry and I draw like a big jawed uh, man, muscular man being angry, it will just look different because of the different proportions. So if you, if you have the feeling it looks too similar, then try to make the expression yourself and try to find a, li a little bit of a different um, facial expression for that or look how other people do the same emotion and look at reference pictures or movies or so on. And then you get a little bit more inspiration for how to convey the same emotion a little bit differently. All right, thank you. So let's do a new layer. Now tell me what, what I'm going to draw. <laughs> what, what, what was it? All right, the results from the poll. Uh, let me share them. It's been a close call and we had a lot of people joining in. We're like 535 people voted. Woo so thanks everybody for doing that. Thank you. Um, and this is the result. So angry is fairly high up there. Surprise was also very high up there. Shy is also just almost even for character one, but by a close margin in love is the expression you want to see on character one. And for character two, also very close call with laughing, scared and confused, all, all very high up there. But Cheeky actually made the race with 32% and taking the win here. So in love and Cheeky. Okay. Now we wait for my Photoshop to wake up again. I think it's a little bit confused with Zoom, actually. It's, In between, it's getting a little bit like, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Please, please give me time. I need to breathe. It's Monday for all of us. In the meantime, I can think about the two characters <laughs> I'm going to draw. Okay, <laughs> So uh, actually, that's a good starting point. Before I start drawing, I try to imagine the scene I want to draw. So I'm trying to think, okay, one character is in love and the other one is cheeky. So one be like, be like, like one will probably be a little bit like, oh my God, this character is so beautiful. Like when you're in love, you're like blushing and your, your eyes usually widen and smile probably. And the cheeky character will maybe be like, hmm. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of what I'm, thinking about right now what I will try to draw. Are we awake? Hello, Photoshop. Now I want to draw. Come on. Ah, it's, th it's there. It's awake. Welcome back. So, or not? Monday. Here we go. So we have in love. And cheeky here. Now I will pick my pencil brush and I will start roughly to plan out where my characters will be. So I usually start with the heads to just know how they locate to each other. So maybe they will be a little bit apart from each other, not 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 hugging already. Come on, it's a bit leggy right now. We, we will get through this. Have patience with the computer. So much has to do. So 
so yeah, I'm trying to imagine where the faces are and what they are, how they locate to each other and what the distance between the characters are. Still not there. Waiting for Photoshop. <laughs> and then what, the next thing I will try to do is to like maybe draw like like uh, emoji type of facial expression in there just to, to know what I will be drawing. So I will have this guy in love, baby. And then I will have this other character here, like. <laughs> a little bit cheeky, so. Um, and this is kind of like my rough first plan. And Photoshop is slow again. It's a lot of anticipation going on here. What will be the next thing she draws when Photoshop is back again? So now I'm trying to like rough out the the bodies and I'm also I, I told you that it's important to find really simple shapes so how you can start planning out the body so I'm always trying like a little bit like of a bean shape for the torso I always separate the the chest part and the hip part because they can rotate a lot independently from each other and then I start drawing limbs and it's like a lot of just like sausagey shapes and i'm trying to imagine what what the arms would be like and if i thought something like this like oh, she's so beautiful or he i don't know yet who i'm drawing I think I can't I can't lift the pencil from from the tablet. Then it has to think again. And um, so one thing when you when you try to draw arms and hands is one possibility is that you start off with the hands and you start off by thinking where the hands will be, and then you try to connect the arm to it, or you start straight away with the arm and then draw the hands on top so maybe let's do the second character and it's the cheeky one and it's a confident person walking by maybe and here i can start with an arm uh, or like on the hip to show confidence And she's like, goodbye, boy, I don't care about you. <laughs> so this is basically how I start with my characters and then I can like lower the opacity of the layer I'm working on and maybe make another one on top if my computer lets me do so. Be yeah, very patient. And then I can start actually detailing it out a little bit more and define the anatomy more of the characters I'm drawing. In a minute. In between you can ask questions <laughs> because there are some delays here. Are we, are we, are we back? Okay. So I move them a little bit more to the middle, I lower the opacity, and I draw another layer on top, and like this I can start detailing my characters out a little bit more. So as I told you, I will start finding where the eyes are. And as I said, usually when you are like in love and have a lot of feelings, your eyes widen a bit. So try to convey that. That's not like the final emotion I'm going for. So it will be more, a little bit more uh, defined in the end. But I'm trying, I'm trying. Any questions regarding uh, yes. just and so on? Yes. So while while Photoshop was running into a creative block, uh, questions popped up. How do you tackle creative block or do you experience creative block? And if so, I do. Everybody does. So the, 
don't worry <laughs> if you have creative block it's a normal part of being an artist I think at some point uh, I started thinking about it less of a block but more like some kind of problem I have to solve so that helped but I had it a lot in the previous years especially when I realized that I'm not that happy in my job uh, and I felt really blocked and I felt like I don't know I, I'm not happy with what I'm drawing right now and I don't know where to go. I don't know what, what I want to draw to be happy. So it was a, a big issue for me and it kind of led to an art block for me to, to just asking those questions. And I think I, I, I had to get new perspectives a little bit. So uh, as I mentioned, going to art events helped a lot, talking to other people. Um, maybe searching for new inspiration helps, like looking at things you haven't seen before and trying to, to see if there is something in there that you might like to put into your, uh, seeing your work more, like you'll find somebody has like really beautiful line art and you're like, oh, I want to have line art like that. And you maybe start to practice and by doing that, you discover something else, uh, what, what you enjoy, but also, what I realized is that sometimes it's really important to just not do art for a while. If it's if it's not making you happy right now, sometimes it's good to take a break. You don't have to force your way through it. Of course, when it is your job, you, you kind of have to still work, but art you, you do for work doesn't have to be like the most creative thing you do. Uh, like it doesn't have to be the perfect reflection of your soul every time you know you it's it's a job and you kind of I know some some tricks and some techniques how I make stuff look look good and how it works so I can still do my job even if I have an art block it will just not be my favorite art piece in the end and maybe I will not enjoy it so it's still possible to work but actually for my private art sometimes I take breaks and I don't do art for a while and and then I realized that at some point I start missing it, uh, missing it, and then I enjoy it again when I'm doing it. So, right. so that my kind of advice to deal with art blocks is like try different approaches, try to look yeah. for different inspiration, and try out different things. Maybe try out a different medium, like a new software or just a different brush, or try traditional art for a moment and not digital and see where it takes you. Maybe maybe you enjoy something about it that you can bring into your main work as well and um yeah uh, but also sometimes just just don't do art and don't think about art just enjoy a video game watch a good movie go out play with friends uh go on a trip maybe not right <laughs> now we have we have COVID, so go on a mental trip maybe into a video game or a good movie or something and maybe something inspires you just something something you see and that you love and where you think, oh, I, now I want to draw something. So for me, it helps sometimes to just to just start missing art again because maybe maybe you have done too much and you're just not enjoying it right now. And, but because for me, I love doing art. So at some point, I always return to it, even if I if I'm not happy for a while. If I don't do art for for a long time, I start realizing that, oh my god, I miss it so much. I just want to move a brush on on my on a piece of paper and it will make me happy. Right. Meanwhile, as you can see, I'm trying to define the characters more and I'm trying also to, to, uh, to suggest some clothing and, and uh, show that they are not naked, although they could be, uh, and just, just throwing in some folds and adding some volume for pants and so on. And kind of, doing my next step here. And also it's important when you have multiple character interaction scenes that you, that you pay attention that they are actually like, it, it's important that your viewer, the, the person who sees your artwork in the end, understands if the people are looking at each other or looking away from each other, because a lot of emotion and relation between the characters is conveyed through, through the eyes. Like if you look at somebody directly, it's a different thing than if you look away, for example, when somebody looks at you, because maybe you, you are pissed at this person or maybe you're just shy and you, you don't 
don't want to be looking at them or you can't and it makes you worry. So if the eyes, uh, so always see if the eyes are actually like looking at each other, if you want them to look at each other or if, you, if they don't, then do it on purpose and make it uh, understandable what the relation of the character is. Please continue behaving, Photoshop. It's very nice right now that I can actually draw. Talking about relations, uh, you you, man you mentioned the um, the art who went like THU Trojan horse was a unicorn early on. Um, do you have um, artists in 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 your direct surroundings or colleagues or a community, a local community that you that you use to bounce ideas and to connect with? Yes, I do. And I'm very thankful for that. Like this is the, I didn't have it when I started out as an artist. And over the past years, I, I, I have grown kind of a community around me. Like we have grown it together. And it means so much to me to have those people. It's so helpful. And it's actually like, you, you can't really force it. You can't like decide, okay, I want to have an art community. I will find one now it doesn't work like this but because I have worked at several companies where a lot of artists were employed I met many people there and some of them became my friends and especially the first job I had where at the Delic where we were doing adventure games um, because everybody was very young and very passionate about their work uh, many people became friends during this time I think there also were some couples and so <laughs> Uh, and also during art events like THU, I also met people again uh, and you start connecting with people like you can't force uh, becoming friends with somebody. Uh, it doesn't happen on like when you say I want to be friends with that person and it happens. But when you see each other more often and you realize that you have um, mutual topics that interest you, which is, for example, art, but also what kind of art you like and what kind of like just art you like to look at and you you realize that some people are just closer to you and you suddenly you are talking more often and then at some point they grow into your little art tribe and I'm very thankful that we have that in Hamburg here now and we have collected people basically collected it sounds really evil like we caught them and and put them in the basement together and now we have them but it, everybody kind of friends brought their friends and we met some other people along the way. And you met, uh, we also had like some local art events in Hamburg where we met other people. I also met a lot of great artists over Instagram and Twitter. And then some, some of them I met in person later. We are waiting for Photoshop again, by the way. And um, like this, your little art community starts growing and it's so helpful to help that, uh, have that because um, you can get honest feedback from people you trust. Like for example, if you put art online and just ask random people for feedback, you might get stuff that is uh, not useful to you because the people don't understand where you're coming from and where you want to go. And you also get jerky comments that you don't want, that are discouraging. So it's kind of, it's a bit of a dangerous uh, uh, game to put art online for critique. I don't like to do that. I, prefer to get feedback from people whose opinion I actually value. Um, and to have those people, you actually have to meet them first. So this is right. uh, what, what I value most about this community we have. And also, since many of us are freelancers in our friend group, it helps with getting jobs, actually, because somebody, for example, I have a job offer, but I don't have to tie the time to do it right now. I will recommend some of my friends because I know they are good and they could do this job. So maybe they will end up getting this job. And the same way I have also got recommended by my friends because they know me It's and they recommend me. Like you rather recommend somebody you know because you know how they work and that they work well than recommending a random person from the right. internet you have never met that, that you think, okay, it might be a good artist, but I don't know them and I don't know if they are actually keeping deadlines and so on. So this is how having art friends is always helpful. 
So it helps with your career, it helps with, with your art style and with your art questions. And it also helps when you have, for example, questions how, how to do taxes and so on. Somebody has already done it and they will give you advice maybe. Thank you. I, I can imagine that for, for some people who are, who are new, just coming out of school and, and taking the first steps in the, in the art community or creative community, it might be daunting to go to events like that or to, to, to join groups online and stuff like that. But I guess you will, you will agree that um, at least my experience with all the events that we get to, you, to go to from Wacom, the people are super approachable and super friendly because most of you guys share this, this common understanding of what it, what it takes to be a creative and, and an artist. So there's already a lot um, that you have in common that you share. So it makes it much, much easier to connect. So my recommendation, if I may add this year is yes, go out, look for like-minded people and, and reach out and connect um, because it's really, really a wealth um, of resources and, and, and inspiration. Yeah, and I also want, want to add that because when I first I went to my first Trojan Horse event, it was like the first big art event where I went, I was so nervous and so shy. I, I was, especially when I met people who were like really way more ahead of me in their career, I thought like this person is so important. They will probably think I'm wasting my time when I talk, uh, their time when I talk to them. And it was such a great experience to actually talk to people and realize that everybody, like even people who are much older than you and much more experienced in the art industry, they, they are still like kind of the same people as you. They come from the same background. They are usually, most of us are just nerds who love to draw. And a lot of us uh, have been like not great at social skills when we were young. So it's like, a lot of common ground where you can talk about like yeah I was also bullied as a kid and I was drawing a lot and you realize like some of your art hero who you thought is probably like the rock star of art has the same story and you suddenly connect and it's so uh, and it also takes away a lot of your worries and your anxiety around people so to me it helped before before that I didn't have many art friends and going to events like THU and losing a little bit of my fear of actually trusting people and connecting to them because it's very vulnerable to go up uh, to somebody and to, like I want to talk to you about art and you're great please talk to me like you are in a vulnerable position like, because they might think that you're an idiot or a dog or like your art is not good so yeah, it's very more worrying to do the first step but when you have done it several times at different events and every time everybody has been just nice and awesome you lose a lot of this Fear and it's easier to open up to people and I think like going to events like this over many years now I think it's what how many years it is now seven or something I have changed as a person it's easier for me to make friends now and to actually trust people so I can recommend it to everyone to actually try to make friends and it's really hard now that we have the whole corona situation and we can't right. actually travel freely so now we have to to do the same thing with online communities but all of those conferences like events like this online are awesome because you can meet people in the chat and you can discuss things and it's not that personal of course um, and it's not the same as looking somebody in the eyes but it's the first step and then you can get in touch. You can like look up the person, for example, on Instagram and on Twitter and start following them and comment on their art and get to know each other more. And you can make friends online like you. It, it is possible. You just need a little bit more time. Sometimes it's it's a different thing than actually make, meeting a person. But it's not that this possibility is gone. It's just you need more patience and a little bit more luck. So really go out there and share your art and share a little bit more about your personality and you will meet people that you can relate to and all those events like for example trojan horse was a unicorn is organizing an online event in november so please check it out and also but also other art events are doing online things now because we all can't travel this year we are all in the same 
trouble now, but we still want to have those opportunities and to meet new people. So just look at the events that are available online and try to, to join as many as possible as are interesting to you. And good luck with finding art friends because they are precious. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, heaps, heaps of questions. Um, digging into the fabulous life of a freelancer. So do you have some sort of a routine or do you keep a schedule? Um, are you basically working a 40 hours work week or how do you, how do you manage yourself time-wise? So uh, honestly, I'm, I'm terrible at keeping this. <laughs> so, I, I hope that uh, through being a freelancer, I will get a little bit better at it. So I think I'm already a little bit better than at the beginning of the year when I started out. But I'm, I'm like, I'm a master procrastinator. So uh, especially when, when, when I'm a bit worried about how I do things, I find a lot of reasons not to do them, not to start them immediately. Like I will clean up my table or sort my files or anything like that. So uh, it is useful to have some sort of structure, but I also like to not to not have like a real nine to five structure because that is something I didn't like about having a full-time job. And I like to, to sometimes just decide that, oh, okay, I will just make a weekend now on Wednesday because I want to then I will have to work on the weekend, of course. So I, I know the price for it, but I like this freedom. But you need to find your balance. Like a lot of people need a really tight structure to, to function well. I want to have more of a free structure where I can like do crazy decisions. Like I don't want to work today at all. And I will work really late tomorrow to, to actually compensate for that bad decision on my side. <laughs> um, and other people can't do that and are not happy when they have to do something like that. So you have to find out what works best for you. Um, but I need to actually, because I am such a procrastinator and because I love social media and get distracted all the time, uh, I have an app on my phone that is like a focus app where I have like time periods of 45 minutes. Um, I just started and during this 45 minute period runs, I cannot look at my phone or like look at Facebook and so on. When it is over, I can take a little break and, and do some social media crap and so on. And hello, Photoshop. Uh, but I need to actually force myself to focus a little bit. And also depending on what kind of task I do, it helps to sometimes listen to music or an audio book or something because it keeps my brain from distractions, but I can't do it for, for all type of work when I do, for example, when I do animation and storyboards and like actually timing and imagining how something mm -hmm. feels in a movie, I have to have silence and actually focus on this timing because I'm imagining a movie in my head and I can't listen to an audio book or, or a song during this. Right. Hey, I can draw again. So yeah, you have to, to experiment a little bit with how much structure makes you happy and how much you need to actually get stuff done. Because if you, if, if you are too free and uh, uh, like putting everything off to the next day, it will really, uh, you will really regret it at some point. <laughs> By the way, here I'm, I'm here with the, with the characters and when I, uh, the great thing about digital art is that you can actually transform and correct things and you don't have to completely erase and draw stuff again. So I'm noticing that he's kind of tilting to the front, my, my guy character here who is in love, and that he is maybe a little bit falling over. So I will move his feet a little bit. I use the transform tool of Photoshop a lot or in other programs as well so we can change your pose a little bit without redrawing everything. So as you can see before, 
he was he was falling over a little bit and now it helps so we have him a little bit more standing on his feet and now photoshop is stuck again so it's time for another question <laughs> no problem plenty <laughs> of questions around um so another question or a lot of questions circling around the same topic is how to find jobs as a freelancer. Um, where do you find them? Um, how important is a portfolio? Um, and how in general do you get noticed or do you make your work get noticed out there? Uh, yes, <laughs> a lot of yes. So it is important to have a portfolio at least from my experience like you i have a lot of art on social media on like instagram and twitter but there i post a lot of sketches i post of a lot of art which is for example unfinished and when somebody like a potential client who just wants to see if they want to hire you they want to see some of your best work some examples of different things you can do but they don't have time to look at your all of your social media profiles and everything you have posted on instagram over the past five years or something so it is good to have like a portfolio site where you have the highlights of your work the things you are most proud of and also focus there on the things you want to do in future so um because for example i like to experiment in art and sometimes i try out things but i i try them for myself and it's not something it's not ready to be done as a job or something but on my portfolio page i don't put all of my art or all of my best art but the kind of art i want to be hired for like for example because I, as i told you i got tired of doing like really intricate illustrations for games so i don't have those in my portfolio because i actually don't want to get hired for jobs like this right like, i know i can do that but i don't put it into my portfolio because i don't want to do it right now for a job i might do it for myself but i don't want to be hired for jobs like that so a portfolio is a way to to filter your work to who what kind of jobs you want to apply for the actual getting noticed part is is hard because there are a lot of good artists out there and you you can just apply to jobs actually that are written out on the internet so you can search on different company sites what they are actually currently looking for and apply to those I haven't done it much yet and the one time I tried it or like the couple of times like I tried to apply for a job at Disney and they didn't yeah, but uh, and um, I'm not applying to jobs much because currently they are coming to me like a lot of coincidences and I think it's because I have done um, like a a lot of um, actual networking while going to events or through my friends, uh, a lot of people know me by now. So when, the moment that I said I am a freelancer now, some people knew, oh, I know Olga, I have seen her work because we met at THU a couple of years back and I might have something for her. And some jobs I got over friends, as I told you, because friends recommend friends when they don't have time for a job. And uh and so many clients if they are happy with what you've done for them in a previous job they will come back to you with their next uh, like when they have something similar or something where they think you could do a, a good job so don't uh, don't ruin your relationships <laughs> with your clients if you work for them even if maybe you are pissed at them at some point try to to be civil uh because they might come back with a better job or um, another job that is paid well or something like that. And I had some like return customers. So I have filled my year right now with work where I didn't apply for, but I got through friend recommendations through my portfolio site. Like somebody found me on ArtStation because I had my work tagged with Storyboard and they were searching for a Storyboard artist. And I did work for them and Apparently, they liked what I did back then because right now I'm doing another job for them. Like it took months, I didn't hear anything back from them, but now they asked me again. So, uh, at some point, I feel like you don't have to search for jobs that much. But in the beginning, it's hard. As I said, uh, right after right. school, I tried to be a freelancer and, and I failed because I didn't have any connections. I didn't know anybody, nobody knew me. And 
I couldn't find great jobs. So it's you have to build it up and you have to have some patience. I hope it answers your question. I think so. I, I find it very helpful. That's good. <laughs> Going to the cheeky girl here. And she's very confident and she has maybe a little bit of a, of, a, of a smirk going on on her face because she's like, haha, he's in love with me, but I don't need him. It's already a full story. Yeah, this is what, what I enjoy about doing uh, character work. And also, it was actually um, a feedback I got during one art event when I was showing my work to somebody from the animation industry. And a lot of my work back then was always like one character being pretty. And uh, this uh, person gave me the advice that I should draw more scenes where there are at least two characters interacting. Because this teaches you to put more storytelling into your art and also to have a relationship between both characters, like how do they react to each other? And it challenges that you are also more in terms of facial expressions. Like when you have one character that uh, is just doing things, like you can't put a lot of emotion in there. But when you have two interacting or even more, there is like so much more possibilities how you can put story and emotion in there. And so since I have started taking this advice to heart and implementing it in my work, I have I think I have learned a lot more. Like I, my my expressiveness of my characters has improved massively since I'm doing that. So that was great feedback I got. And I can, I'm, I'm giving this feedback now to everybody else because it helped me so much. <laughs> Did we have more questions? Yeah, trying to stay on top of them. <laughs> um, okay, we've got some questions that are more actually drawing and, and technique related okay um one very basic question is like how how big is your canvas and how do you define it um i'm trying to work as big as my computer can handle basically because mm -hmm. uh, you might always want to you don't know what you want to do with your artwork in the future and maybe you are really lucky in this thing you are drawing turns out really well and you want to print it out as a big picture and put it on your wall or give it as a present to somebody but then you realize that you have drawn it as in a low resolution and you can't print it and it would be really sad so i'm trying to especially for illustrations i'm trying to um, when i am doing a new canvas oh, let's not do that that's confusing him i'm trying to put it, uh, have at least 300 dpi and like an a page like an A4 page and 300 dpi at least when when my computer is nice to me and like not like this uh, I might even do 600 dpi so it's double the size it's mm -hmm. you can you, when you print it uh, afterwards you can print it up to almost like this size uh, if you uh, depending on the printing technique so for illustrations I try to do this and when I do storyboard, because I have to do a ton of ton of layers and a lot of frames, uh, most computers will die if you do it in a huge um, layer size. So there I, I work in the screen resolution. So 1920 1, per 1080 pixels, which is like the full HD resolution. So when I do storyboards, I work in that size, so I can do a lot of layers and a lot, a lot of copying layers and moving stuff around, and the um, performance doesn't die from it. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Makes makes sense. Makes yeah. makes total sense. Um, into the drawing. So we we've covered eyes quite quite a bit. 
Um, there's one remaining question concerning eyes is like, okay, what is actually the biggest mistake that you can do in eyes? And the other two questions are, um, can you elaborate a little bit on how to do noses, mouths, and hair? Okay. Let me finish this up a little bit and then I will do noses and hair. In terms of mistakes, I, I don't think that there is such a thing as like a mistake mistake. So, because some things might not be correct, but work with the style that the person is drawing. So I don't think you can make like a total mistake with eyes, but if something looks wrong, then you have to reconsider the way that you are doing things. Like if you are going for a fully realistic style, you have to figure out how to draw realistic eyes um, because otherwise nobody it will be unbelievable to look at. Um, but other than that, depending on the style you are doing, like when we go back to my inspirations here, when you look, for example, at 90s Sailor Moon, which has inspired me a lot uh, back then, they, they don't have proper human eyes, but still they have an expression and it works. Uh, like when you look at, at more like stylized characters like those here, they also, they just have like a lid and a dot that indicates the eye. So try what works with your style. You, you have to kind of study the real human eye, but you don't have to draw it completely realistically, depending on what you want your artwork to look like uh, in the end. So don't think about mistakes. Just try to, to see if it works and try a different style if it doesn't work. And then we were talking about noses and and mouths and hair. And then we are still waiting a little bit for Photoshop. It's really confused with Zoom. It's a new experience <laughs> for me that, that Zoom is so, so confusing. Like this, this computer has a lot of, of power actually, but Zoom and Photoshop, it's like, Please help, I want to die. But in general, also think about um, really rough shapes first before you go into a detailed nose. Like for those, I've tried to imagine like some sort of like triangle, like from the front, it's a little bit of more of a query shape and from, from the side, it's more of a triangle. Come on, let's draw. And then I try to detail it out but as you can see on the things that are on screen right now, while we are waiting for Photoshop, you can, there are many ways to really simplify things like noses and it still works can, uh, without like being really anatomical about it. And when I can draw again, I will draw. But no. Do we have some more more theoretical question while I'm waiting? Yes, uh, there was actually a question that um, popped up in the registration to the to the webinars. Is do you occasionally hide Easter eggs or references to to friends or family or people you know in your in your illustration? I do. I, I love to do it. I I even without hiding them, I often put my friends and things into, into pictures because I like drawing them because I like them and also because I draw a lot of personal experiences um, they come up a lot so they inspire me they end up in my work a lot but I also try to put in references to things I like in there like you will find probably like Sailor Moon and manga references in a lot of my drawings like very hidden but but I'm trying <laughs> Um, so yeah, when I find a place to do that, I do that. Do people notice? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> so I can finally draw. So let's try to think about faces and, uh, and noses. Like when drawing noses, I try to start like with, with a really rough shape of it to just indicate how big the nose is in the face because it depends on the character how big you want to draw the nose and also for the mouth i also usually just start with the mouth line because it shows the expression of the mouth and then you can start 
um, defining is on top when you have uh, this rough under drawing. So if you imagine nothing happens. I feel a little bit like a magician. I'm like doing something and then, then I'm waiting and then maybe something happens. <laughs> So you can start defining on top, like, okay, we are seeing this nose from below. So we will look into the nostrils more. Maybe we can indicate the top of the nose a little bit. And for the lips, we have to give them some thickness actually. So you, you might show the upper lip and a little bit of a fold beneath the lower lip. Uh, lip. And so if you have like somebody smiling, you can just start with the basic smile line. And then on top of that, you can define the shape of the lips, like how full they are. So yeah, think really simple first and you can make it more, more complicated and more detailed afterwards. Also consider that there are a lot of different nose shapes uh, in different people. Like you have, can have something that is really cute and small, or you can have like something that's more straight and big. Or uh, I don't know, like a really pointy witch nose. And then you can, like when you, when you draw this type of noses in the face, you can always try to indicate that like I want to draw this pointy which face the uh, which nose in this this face just looking a little bit up so Or for example, if you draw a face like this and you, instead of a more long shape, you draw something more potato shape for the nose, it will also result in a different nose shape. And like this, you can create a variety of different characters. And I think every artist has their favorite nose. Like I have this, this one nose that I draw the most for my characters because you kind of have the, like the, the shape that works most well for you. And I think a lot of like arts, artist art styles, you can recognize the artist by the nose. So I think like my, my nose is a bit of this, this a little bit roundish, cute nose is what I draw a lot. Yeah, that looks familiar. Yeah, <laughs> like my favorite nose, <laughs> and everybody has that. But you like you have to be be aware that you have your favorite nose to draw, and sometimes change things up a bit, especially when you have a character lineup or a comic or something like that. Try to to give them a little bit different noses because you you know your comfort zone and and know when to leave it. <laughs> More questions. Hmm. Yes. Um, concerning digital and analog, um, how much do you still do with real pen on paper and colors on paper? Is that still part of your workflow or is that more, um, is that more the fun part? Um, it depends. 
I still enjoy it a lot. So I try to do like sometimes I get just really tired of looking at the screen for days because a lot of my work requires working on a computer, especially things like storyboarding and things that are animated. You can animate on paper, but it's very tedious. And in the end, you have to get it to your to your clients digitally. So you would have to scan everything and so on. So it's more reasonable to start uh, immediately on the computer. But sometimes, especially when I want to take a break from work work and want to draw art for myself, I like to work traditionally because then it feels more different. When I have been working on a computer for the whole day and then I sketch in my sketchbook, it feels like free time because I'm doing a different thing. If I would continue sitting in front of the computer, even if I try to draw something for myself, it's still it's still more connected to the work work. So it doesn't feel that that free and that much like like I'm, I'm actually doing something for myself. So I'm using it a bit as a tool for um, uh, making a difference between I'm, I'm working now and I'm, I'm, I'm actually like just exploring now. But it's also, I have done some, some client work traditionally as well. And I like to combine things too. So I like to, um, like do the outlines traditionally, for example, and color them digitally. So I'm, I'm still experimenting with that and trying to find like my favorite combinations, but, but I like both. So I try to combine the best of both worlds. I'm just adding a little bit of color here while you might have still some questions and then I will go eat something. Yes, I was about to say, we're, we're, we're getting close to two hour session here. <laughs> Are there still, still people? I don't see that. Uh, you want to know how many people? I, I just wanted to know if everybody has left already. Yeah. No, no, there's there's still a lot of people in, in, in the room. I'm very honored. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And there's still a lot of questions coming in. So apologies, guys. We we it's impossible to answer all the 119 open questions that are still in the Q and A. Um, but I find one that's been voted up by 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 multiple likes here. Um, so that is definitely something um, that I want to pick up on. Um, it's, it's not a lighthearted question, but it's okay. something that you that that we see a lot in the in the creative community and that that a lot of people are are struggling with or, or see themselves confronted with and that's the good old question about the imposter syndrome so do you ever feel like you're not good enough for the jobs that you're doing or that you're asked to do or is is this imposter syndrome thing if I might call it like that something that that you experienced yes definitely so i think the thing you everybody needs to know about imposter syndrome is that almost everybody has imposter syndrome at some point and it's some amount so it, like i i thought before that at some point you are good enough and famous enough and established enough that it goes away and that you feel like okay now i'm a real artist and i don't need to worry anymore but the truth is, it's always kind of part of yourself. And maybe it's also not such a bad part completely. Like I know it can be very torturing to, to think about that. But even like the, the greatest and biggest artists have worries sometimes because all of like people who look at our art from the outside and don't know what goes on in us, they think, oh, this is perfect. This is awesome. But you yourself, you, you you look at the same piece of art and you feel like, ah, but I made a mistake there and this line is not perfect and it's not as good as my favorite artist. Everybody must see that. Everybody must see this, all of those errors and imperfections. But most people don't. Like the truth is, and some of them do, but it doesn't make your art bad. It just makes it imperfect and no, nobody is perfect. So. Having a little bit of a worry is a normal human thing. I think when you don't worry about anything, you're a bit of a psychopath. So you should like, when you realize that you are worrying about things like that, it's, you have to kind of pat yourself on the back and be like, 
I'm a human. I, it's, it's normal to worry because I have emotions about this thing. I care about art and it's normal to, to worry about it. And so to me, it helps to remind myself that everybody feels that even the best and the most awesome artists probably feel it at some point. And that it's, it doesn't mean that you are fraud. Like if everybody feels that, and even people who are really geniuses feel that, it can't, it, like, it, it's just proof that it doesn't mean that you're bad. It is just proof, uh, it also just shows that you are worrying, that you care. And so I try to remind myself of that. And I also, I notice that it's, I can also take it a little bit as a good sign for something. Like when I notice that I worry about doing a job well for something, I, it's the job I care about. Like when I, when I have some, some kind of job where I'm like, eh, I, I can totally do that. I don't care. Uh, like, I don't need to worry. Probably it's not, it's uh, probably I don't care that much. Like when, when you care about something and then it's important to you, you want to do it good. And then right. of course you get a little bit worried. Can I actually do it as good as I would like to? So then you get a little bit of an imposter syndrome. And at those moments where you don't feel like anything and where you're like, yeah, okay, I can do it. Like, yeah, it just it will work. And, and maybe it's a little bit of an alarm sign that this is not the most interesting or valuable work for you to do. Maybe you stop doing stuff like that. Maybe you need to find a little bit more of a challenge. Like you don't have to like dive full in into imposter syndrome and uh, apply for jobs that you are like really too far away from, but Sometimes you, you need to take a little bit of a risk. And actually when somebody, like you, you usually think like, oh, they hired me at some point, they will realize that I'm a total fraud and they will kick me out and they will realize what a terrible mistake it was. But then this, it, and sometimes it might happen that people realize that you are not, not actually up to the job uh, that you applied for. But usually they know who they are hiring. They, they look at the, at the stuff that you have presented them and you they have made the decision to let you work on that so they they are professionals like usually the people who hire you are professionals so they kind of know what to expect when you, they see your work so you can be uh, they, you can be that much of a fraud already and even if you realize that the job is something like that you're not up to the job it's it's also like sometimes it happens and it's normal and you will not be expelled from the industry forever for for doing one job badly it's it's also part of the process to figure out what you are maybe not made for so for example i was a lead artist on a project and i realized that maybe i was not ready to be a lead artist at the point i was very young and i I knew how to give feedback, but I didn't know how, for example, to manage people emotions, people's emotions and talk to them without like kind of without sounding mean, for example, when I give them feedback to their work. So maybe I, I was just not not ready for this job yet. And I survived it. Now I, I have learned from it. I know what I could do better next time. And it didn't kill me. So <laughs> I hope all of this kind of helps you with your imposter syndrome. Thank you so much for for sharing that. I think it's a it's a super important topic, and because many of us are are sitting at home and, and we're sort of lacking contact with like minded people, it sometimes becomes even more difficult to remind yourself to pat yourself on the shoulder and say like, yes, we're all human. And so I think it's a very nice way to put it. Yeah. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay, I think. I'm 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 secretly hoping and waiting for that last character to be colored a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm just like giving him, him like really like. Usually, I would give, do more of an effort with the colors, but I want just to to finishing up, uh, finish it up a bit and give everybody their freedom. <laughs> you can <laughs> but, go. But that that's that's the last colorful question. Let's put it that way. Play on words, yeah. cheeky. Um, how how do you select the colors? Um, yeah, I struggled <laughs> with it a lot, especially because like a lot of my professional work came like first I started drawing manga and it, everything was black and white. So I was like, I learned how to draw lines and I learned, learned how to shape things and grayscale and everything was easy. And then at some point I realized, oh my God, there's a whole world of color out there and it's scary. But 
um, you get kind of used to it. You have to experiment your way into it. Like you can, I, a little bit of knowing about color theory is good. Uh, like for example, I like to have a circular color window, kind of color panel, as you see here on uh, in my Photoshop window. Like I think Clip has one automatically for Photoshop. This is a plugin I installed, the Colorus plugin. You can buy it um, because this one helps me select colors. Like when I realize I have a lot of colors that are, for example, on this reddish. Um, orange side of things, like for example, with those characters here that I have drawn, I want to balance it out a little bit. And then you just go to the opposite side of the circle and pick a light blue, like I chose for a headdress and it already light, livens up colors a lot. So this is like a little bit of like just basic color theory. And there are some rules which you can follow, which help you select colors. But uh, other than that, I try to, first select colors that I just like and then try to make it work afterwards like I when I realize some colors just don't, don't go well then then I have to to make changes to that but first I, will, I, I want to select for example when I start with characters I usually start with their skin colors and their hair colors because I kind of I know my characters and I know, for example, I want this character to have red hair. So it is already decided for this picture that the hair will be red. Then you start with this color that you know and then the skin color that you probably also know because it's your character. And then you try to make everything else work around that. And that is best by just by choosing a little bit of the neighboring colors in the wheel or by choosing a bit of the, like some highlights of an opposite color to make and to balance out the main colors. These are like my favorite tricks for coloring and for different color moods and times of day, it's best to look at a lot of reference pictures. Like when you want to make an evening scene and you want people to look at your image and immediately see, okay, this is evening and not, not morning and so on. You probably have some idea what an evening looks like, but if you collect a bunch of reference photos for that and and actually like study what colors the lights and the shadows have in this type of situations, you realize that you only had a very basic idea of what an evening is, and it helps you select colors in the end. Right. I hope that helps a little bit. Like. I it could does. talk so much about color. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole big new topic, but as a starting point, that helped me. And then just look at pictures you like and look what kind of color combinations other artists take and look at photos and look, for example, at movies. Movies are usually very, like, they have very nice color design because people pay big attention to that while making movies. So look at them, look, see how, how they are still choosing their light and color situations. It's a great way to study that. And I think I will I will just leave those characters be now. Like this is the this type of detailing, this is like kind of the most detail I, I would go for a storyboard, but if I would do it for a comic or an illustration, I would definitely add much more detail on top. So I would make cleaner lines and I would actually select my colors properly and add some sort of shading and so on. But for, for just like giving a, an impression of the character and conveying a, a little bit of story, this is already enough. So I will leave it at that. Um, and I hope you could learn a little bit from me how I approach things. And for everything else, please check out my uh, social media stuff, which is, uh, this is my um, nickname on Instagram and Twitter. It's, it's Asorel. And um, I have a Patreon where I also sometimes share parts of my workflow and you, I, I might share more about how I work in future when I have to actually time to prepare this sort of content and then you can learn more secrets. But I hope this was a good starting point for getting it's, to know me and how I draw. 
it's been a fantastic session. Thank you so much, Olga, for taking the time and showing us uh, your workflow and your art and talk about yourself. We filled two hours. I think <laughs> nobody was bored even a split second. We still have hundreds of people in the in this session. Thank you so um, much. It was it was it was really it was really um, amazing. And thank you everybody for for joining. Yes, um, I hope you. you enjoyed it. Um, let me quickly share my screen for the wrap up. Um, thank you for the very cute two characters. Um, I think they definitely show in love and cheeky. So good job. Well done. Approved. I will post them also on Twitter and Instagram so you, you can see. And this the recorded session will be online, right? So everybody can rewatch the parts where I was like really very quick in explaining. <laughs> yeah, will it be? You will share right. it, right? Yeah, we, we will, exactly. So the entire session will be shared on, on YouTube in a couple of days. Um, so you can rewatch it fast forward to the in, to to the bits that that you missed out on or you want to relive through um for in order to not miss anything of this do follow us on social media do also follow um our partners on social media obviously um go to azrael um across all the different social media streams follow her she's got an amazing portfolio on there um a lot of inspiring stuff and really entertaining um if you now still consider spending some money, do go to the Wacom eStore forward slash comic minus week, where you have the full range of offers um, exclusive for this week's attendance. Um, that is it from our end. Coming up are a range of um, interesting talks later today and the following days. I think the next session in English is at 3 p.m. European time with Dylan. And we have for the people, um, the Nighthawks um, amongst us, we've got a chat and draw session at 8 p.m. tonight, and we've got a Wacomic DJ session at midnight. So stay tuned or dial back in again later today or tomorrow. It's been a fantastic time, a fantastic session. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Olga. Thank and you so see much. See you soon. It was so Ciao. much fun. Ciao. Bye.